Thank you, Michael, and good morning, fellow cotton growers and industry. My name is James Duddy, and my family are, and I are cotton growers at Gundawindi on the Queensland side of the McIntyre River. My father, Brian, set out in 1982 to develop South Caledon, a property he bought off elders, pastoral, into a dryland and irrigated cropping farm. The first irrigation development started off in 1989 and the first cotton crop grow was grown in the summer of 89. Development continued at a pace until the moratorium of 2001 and after that a lot of future development was put on hold or in limbo. By this stage we had currently had 1200 hectares developed siphon furrow irrigation. In 2003 three lateral moves were installed to increase our irrigated areas our irrigated areas in the areas that were earmarked for development. These were installed until our water situation had become clearer, but also for the water savings and minimal earth movings. Once the resource operation plan was finalised for the border rivers, we were then able to build another dam on the Calendern Creek, which commenced in 2010 once the red tape was completed and the cash flow was available, or at least in sight. Whilst the inf infrastructure programs were available then, I was a bit naive and fully didn't understand water trading or the programs available to take use of the funding. We were fortunate, fortunate enough, however, to have the dam finished, pumps installed, only to receive flooding rains the next day. But by building this dam, it highlighted the plight of almost every cotton grower and that is the catch-22 of cotton farm development or repair, whereby in a drought, you're pessimistic and deficient in cash flow, and when it's wet, the dams are full, and you're optimistic, but you're busy growing crops and trying to create that required cash flow. So since I returned to the family business, I've seen this catch-22 all too often, and as a result, we haven't relays at our country in the past 15 years, and our watering inefficiencies are really starting to show our field averages are also starting to be affected. The yield on good areas that watered well was what really drove us to consider embarking on a program to re-level the country, which in my eyes was still a very economic practice to do, but I knew when the fields were available and out of crop, I knew I'd face that same catch-22 situation again. So I knew it needed to be done to the farm, but I missed I must admit, it was the other farmers in the valley that were taking part in the programs that made me give the programs more thought. So I'll quickly outline the programs and what they're about. The New South Wales Sustaining the Basin, Infrastructure Farm Modernisation and Queensland's Healthy Headwaters Water Use Efficiency Projects are very similar. There's a few different administrative points and that's all that separates them. The farmer puts in 10% in the Queensland side and 20% in New South of the total cost of the project and the remainder is funded by the government through giving back at least 50% of the water savings. This is through the sale of the farmer's water licence equivalent to the minimum 50% water savings achieved in the project. That water licence is theoretically being sold to the government for anywhere between 2 and 2.5 times its current market value as Michael pointed out before. I'll cover an example of the economics a little bit later. On South Caledon, we had funding accepted on two Queensland Healthy Headwater projects and one New South Wales STB IFM and have an application in for another. The first Healthy Headwaters project is to reconfigure an existing shallow storage that covered 350 hectares into a 40 hectare storage with pump site to hold about 3,000 megalitres of water, which worked out to be about seven and a half metres deep. The second involves reconfiguring 430 hectares of siphon furrow fields into bankless. The New South Wales project involves a reconfiguration of a small surge area, one lateral move machine to replace 100 hectares of siphon, and a reconfiguration of another 180 hectares into bankless irrigation. Obviously, the water savings are the huge number one advantage here, but there are many others to consider. Extra water storage beyond the typical farm will, I think, will pay for itself as we seem to be getting 
longer periods of dry times and bigger wets. Climate change or not, I'll leave that one for the politicians and scientists, but, but based on my limited observations, I want to hold more water during the wet times to last longer into the dry times. The lateral move irrigators or spray irrigation is giving us the versatility of crops. The returns per megalitre can be just as good on grains as cotton due to the precise amount of water applied at the right times. We particularly like growing wheat and chickpeas, even when double cropping after cotton under spray. When there's only a small amount of water left in a ring tank and the net present value on that water is much better being used on a winter crop before it is to be evaporated through the summer to finish a naturally smaller area of cotton. There is not a whole lot of information on bankless yet, but I do like the look of what I see. There's also plenty of data to support fast waterings. Biggest advantage of us will be the significant reduction in watering times and increasing the yields in a hot summer. For us to speed up our current system, we would have to double our siphon numbers. And as a result, the seasonal labour force. And I really don't want to be starting twice as many siphons. So not only would there be water savings, labour savings, machinery savings, i.e. the rotor bucks, drive through channels, there's also the ability to water on demand, i.e. Sunday morning and not having to round up a pack of backpackers that have been out the night before celebrating their last paycheck. There is also a lot of development in technology and science going into moisture stress on cotton, so it'll be interesting to see what tools and information we have going into the future to water on demand. <coughs> I'm going to just go through a a little example on a 400 hectare cotton farm and converting it into, into a bankless. For us it roughly costs us about $2,500 a hectare to convert our fields into bankless with including a re-lasering and the associated structures. So with a 400 hectare bankless farm we're looking at a total cost of a million dollars. The farmer contribution of $200,000 and the government's funding the rest at eight hundred. dollars These are all pretty loose figures but I've put a water allocation value of $2,000 per megalitre. And if I went halfway between, I'm picking a figure out of the air of 2.2 times, um, we're getting $4,400 per megalitre for the water sold. For, the, for that $800,000, you'd have to basically sell 182 megalitres of entitlement. The market value of that water is then 364000 that you're transferring to the government. So that gives you a total contribution into the project of, uh, of $564,000. You then have your tax depreciation advantages thanks to the generous federal government as of May 12, we can actually depreciate it in the year that it's spent. And then of 300,000 and we also have to pay income tax on the money we receive from the government as a part of the subsidy. So the initial 364,000 will be a capital sale and the remainder up until 800,000 is deemed as an income subsidy from the government, so you'll have to pay tax on that of about 130,000, I think I've got there, yep. That brings up the total farmer's real contribution of 395,000, or roughly 39.5%. So for a million dollar project, you only had to pay close to 400,000, so nearly a 60% six, discount on it. Back to when I was looking at re-lasering re all, all the country, we thought it was going to cost us roughly $700 a hectare. That works out at about $280,000 and the tax advantages of that brings it back to $196,000. I still think that's good practice because it wouldn't have taken much more cotton to grow 
and pay for that. After speaking to a valuer about what the potential valuation after a bankless conversion would be, he came up with a figure of about $1,100 over and above what we had per hectare. So on a 400 hectare development, you're looking at 440,000. So as you can see, your balance sheet's improved for a total cost of 400,000. You're nearly out in front and you've got a much better design farm. Another important, another important factor to consider is the actual yield of the water allocation you would be transferring to the government. On the border rivers, I believe it to run around the 50 to 60 percent mark for general security. So if the farm in this example had 2,000 megalitres of allocation, or five megalitres per hectare, and that allocation yielded 55 percent, would have 1,100 megalitres on average harvested. You give up 182 megalitres, or anywhere between 182 and 364 part of the project. You now have, sorry, you give up 182 megalitres for the project to the government. You now have 18, 18 megalitres and yielding on average 1,000 megalitres. You're down only 100 megalitres on the water average harvested, but your project is meant to save you anywhere between 182 and 364 of that harvested water. So therefore, your net water is actually better than before, which you can then place on more crops. So obviously this is all pretty loose figures, but it does give food for thought. I find it pretty hard to find a ne negative reason economically on our farm. Politi politically, I think these programs are the only way the water should be returned to the environment. The multiplier effect of the infrastructure spending goes right through the local community and the water savings will produce m more and again that in income will multiply through the economy. Much the opposite for buyback which I strongly disagree with. I have not fully completed a project but my experience so far has been a good one only because I'm comfortable with the economics of the situation. Again, this is food for thought, and if you are interested, I would highly recommend talking to the project teams. John Ritchie and Rosie Henner in Queensland and Bill Williams in New South Wales, who I dealt with, and I'm sure there is others in these teams. They will surely help you through the process. Other things to get started would, number one, would be to assess your water licences and capabilities taking into the consideration of the yields and the market value and your own historical use of that water. And if you're worried about having a white elephant at the end after you sell some water to the government, maybe look to buy some water in a place of water you're trading out. Same applies if the water you want to sell is not eligible. Try and buy some water for the project and trade your worst performing or least used water out at a later date when the opportunity arises. Even at a later... Also talk to your irrigation designers, suppliers and earth movers to get an idea of costs in which you can work with. There is a few ducks to line up to get an application in, but going through a few of these st steps can get you started. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me to talk on these programs and I hope that it will be of benefit to some fellow cotton farmers.